Happy spring break, everybody. Um, well, no, honestly, if we're being honest here, I'm sure you guys aren't happy because you're um, learning calculus over spring break. Sorry, not my fault that there are 12 fewer days this term. Just trying to find some places to give you some um, quick instruction and some lessons that I feel like should be pretty easy and that you should be well equipped to handle. So instead of um, talking about it more, I'm just going to go ahead and jump into this first lesson that I'm going to do here via YouTube, and that is to talk about the derivative of e to the x. Now, when we get to chapter 5, we're going to spend a lot more time on uh, exponential and logarithmic functions and what calculus um, does with those two um, types of functions. But for now, I just want to get you that derivative rule itself for e to the x. Because as of right now, we really only have a couple derivative rules. Um, and by extension, then we only have certain integration rules. Um, we have stuff for trig functions. We've got um, like the integral and derivative of sine and cosine. Um, and we also have stuff for polynomials as well as just simple powers of stuff. What we don't have though is anything where the actual exponent is a variable. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start by kind of showing you like how this works or kind of giving you some visual verification that it works. Then I'm going to go ahead and move through and actually illustrate the rule for you, give it to you, and then do a couple examples first of just taking the derivative with of an e to the x type function as well as then also showing you a couple examples where we use that fact to do other things that come up in calculus. So to start out with, I figured what would work is I would start by just kind of showing you um, that this thing actually works. So kind of helping you see how this derivative goes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out my T89. Hope you can't see it. Now you can see it. And I'm going to go ahead and ask the calculator to do something for me. First, I'm going to ask it to graph e to the x. So I'm just punching it right in the calculator. The e to the x button is right above ln because, you know, they're related. ln is base e. And if we look at it, we get that normal exponential shape right there. So great, we've got that normal exponential shape. So it's interesting. And of course, we could even ask the calculator to calculate for us the derivative at certain places using that button that we used last term a little bit. So for example, if I was interested in knowing what the derivative was at 0, I could go ahead and just press Enter, and it says that the derivative there is about 1. Like, I assume it's 1. Um, I could do the same thing with, I don't know, let's try it at x equals 1. It says the derivative is 2.718283. Interesting. Whatever. Okay, well that's great. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the calculator to not graph e to the x, but graph its derivative. Now again, we've never done this before, and it's not something I highly encourage because you'll probably kill your battery within a couple problems like this. But I'm actually going to use the math function, math feature, go down to number 8, which is called nderiv. Has nothing to do with the Orson Scott card series. Um, that was a pause so you could laugh. Um, puns. And from here, I'm going to actually punch in e to the x. And what this function will do, if you've not figured it out by now, is it's going to calculate out the derivative for us of the function e to the x in terms of x. And instead of putting in a value here for this third argument, um, basically I want to calculate it at any value x. So I'm going to put in x again. Basically this is saying find the derivative of e to the x at the x value x. So basically it's going to put a plot out of all the derivatives of e to the x at all the little points that are out there. So again, let's see. What do we get? We get our calculator going kind of slowly. It's crunching it out. And huh, okay, well that's, that's interesting. So I mean we could trace again. We could see some values of the derivative there. Remember when we punched in 0 on the last one, it said the value was 1. Oh, look at that, it's that again. When we punched in 1, it said the value of the derivative was 2.71. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Okay, great. So what have we really done here? We've graphed the derivative. We've looked at the actual function. All we can kind of tell is, hey, those guys look kind of similar. They're both kind of those, you know, curvy exponential thingies. Well, now let's do something else. Let's grab both of these puppies right in the same window. Let's see how they differ from one another. Like, how close and how similar are they? So let's see. Hmm, that's that's funny. It's it's no longer graphing anything. Something must have gone wrong. I'm not sure what's going on here. So there's we're going to draft just the derivative. So here's the derivative. Okay, there it is. That's the derivative of e to the x, all plotted out nicely for us. Whereas here we're going to tack on and have it graph the function e to the x also. Okay, we'll just wait for it and. Okay, this is really embarrassing when this happens. Calculator can't seem to figure it out. It must be broken. So let me just put in a different function here for a second. See if it's really broken or not. If it just can't graph that other thing. Oh, there's x 
that well that's huh okay so something weird is going on here hmm I'm not sure what it is that's happening here let's try it one more time maybe this will work let's see here are the two functions here's e to the x and here comes its derivative plot it out nicely for us coming anytime now just wait for that to stop low this is this is really frustrating it seems I mean if we're looking at what we have here on the picture it appears that e to the x and its derivative look exactly the same I mean maybe we're just not zoomed in enough let's just zoom in a little bit maybe we'll be able to see the difference in there let's just zoom in right there you know okay there's e to the x let's wait for its derivative its derivative's got to be coming here pretty soon should be right around the corner. <laughs> it did it. Okay, so see? Okay, so something weird's going on here, right? You're going, why is it plotting the same thing? Like, we saw both graphs. They both are similar in shape, but they can't possibly be the same thing, right? Well, um, I hate to be the one to break this to you, but in fact, that that is the rule for e to the x. You might not believe this, but e to the x is by far the single coolest derivative rule that we have out there in existence bar none. The reason for that is this. The derivative with respect to x of e to the x is this. You're not going to believe this, but it's e to the x. Like that's right. This function e to the x is its own derivative. So now you might not believe me here. So let's go back and look at it one more time. Forget about this end deriv thingy. Let's just look at something here really fast. So I'm going to graph e to the x. I'm going to zoom normal. There it is. And now I'm going to trace. So what happens at x equals 1? Because it's basically saying the value of the derivative is the function's value itself. So at x equals 1, the value of the function is 2.71828281828. We know that. What is that? That's e. So 1 comma e. Well, now I'm going to calculate the derivative here at x equals 1, 2.78718288, and of course it's off by a little bit here. But in fact that shouldn't surprise you because the calculator is not very good at calculating derivatives. It's not very good on stuff when we get really small in our values. So in fact you can probably believe at this point that hey this is working out. It says e to the x is its own derivative. And what's nice about that is this is a really easy derivative rule to use then. And ha, no, 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 that's a force of habit. No, we don't need any question marks. We've just got an exclamation mark. So e to the x is its own derivative. Okay, so let's look at this in just a second. Let's use the chain rule, look at some examples, and let's see how this works for us. Now, about that chain rule, as we said, e to the x is its own derivative, but of course we're not just going to always have to deal with the function e to the x. There could be other stuff happening where we might have to use some other rule or other calculus to look at it. So the most important one to look at is the chain rule, because otherwise you know, we're just going to use product rule or quotient rule. So for the chain rule, basically what changes is we need to think about what's going to happen when we have some sort of other function happening up here inside the e to the x. So if that exponent is some other function, like say sine of x, or x squared plus 5, or something along those lines. Well, following through the chain rule, it always says that we get, as our function, we get the function of the thing, and then times the derivative of the inner function. Well, for this purpose, we're just going to get that the derivative is e to the f of x. Like, notice that's nothing that interesting. It's the exact same thing we had. So the derivative of e to the f, e to the stuff is still e to the stuff. But then, of course, we have to satisfy the chain rule by multiplying times the derivative of that stuff. So, in fact, the derivative of e to the f of x power is e to the f of x times f prime of x. So, from there, basically, we have the uh, generalized exponential derivative rule. And now we're ready to kind of get started and take a look at some functions that involve e to the x. So, where I'm going to start is I'm going to start with a very simple one, just to kind of throw it out there. And again, the purpose here is to very quickly get you some rules and stuff over the break. And the first function I'm going to look at and ask you to calculate the derivative of is y equals e to the x squared. So we want to find y prime. So that's all we're looking for here. So for the purposes, you can kind of think about it according to our last rule there. Basically f of x in this case 
is going to be x squared, so we're going to have to deal with the function from there. Well, let's do this as simply as possible. So the derivative of e to the x squared. Okay, well, the derivative of e to the x squared, which I'm going to write that way, is going to be equal to the function itself. So e to the x squared. Ah, geez, this x is so cruddy. e to the x squared, and then times the derivative of x squared. So that way it satisfies f of x is x squared, and then here we've got the derivative of x squared. So nothing real surprising there. So what is that equal to? Well, the derivative of x squared is just 2x. So in reality, we have e to the x squared times 2x. But of course, that doesn't look as nice. We usually write it as 2x e to the x squared. And so there is our derivative, y prime. So again, nothing really that difficult about it. It's just a little weird. For some reason, when we think of um, an inside function, thinking about that inside function as being in the exponent is a little bit weird, because it seems like it's up top. It's not necessarily inside. But if you've ever lived in an attic, obviously you're still inside the house. It's just upstairs. So from there, we've got our first example of a function involving e to the x. OK, now that we've got the basic rule there, um, and I've kept it up here just in case uh, so that we have it hanging around. Basically, now that we've got that rule for e to the x, let's use it in some more um, interesting context. So I'm just going to do two more examples. This one um, involving implicit differentiation, and then a final one involving um, an analysis of a function. The rest I'll leave to you because it is, again, again, a fairly basic rule, especially now that you've got it written out there. So for this guy, we want to find dy dx for the function given by e to the sine x minus 4e to the x equals 42. So just some random implicit differentiation kind of function. And of course, I know this is implicit differentiation because I've got a y just thrown in there. The function doesn't read y equals blah. Like, that's just not there. So for this guy, basically, I need to keep in mind the chain rule um, that I've been using here, up here. Like, in this case, anytime we have a y, I have to remember the chain rule. As well as anytime there's something interesting inside that e to the x, I have to remember the chain rule as well. So to start this guy off, I'm going to differentiate this entire thing like so. So the first term, I've got to find the derivative of e to the sine of y. So I've got to do that. Then I have to subtract the derivative of 4e to the x. And of course, then that's all going to be equal to the derivative of 42. So again, if you're not sure how fast 42 is changing, um, well, look at it, measure it, you know, time it, get a stopwatch out, and you'll be able to figure it out real fast. OK, so I'm going to start with the one on the left, probably the most difficult of them, the most challenging of this group. And when I look at this, I see e to a function, so e to a power. So that power is interesting. So I've got to first do the derivative of this guy as e to the sine of y. The reason is the derivative of e to the f of power, or e to the function power, is equal to e to the function. So that part of it is always there. So e to the sine of y, the derivative is e to the sine of y. Now we've got to multiply times the derivative of the sine of y. So what is the derivative of the sine of y? Well, we'll deal with that in a second. We'll go one step at a time. Next one, 4e to the x. Well, the derivative of 4 times something is just 4 times that function's derivative. So it's really minus 4, the derivative of e to the x. But the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. So the derivative of 4e to the x is uh, it's 4e to the x. So huh, nothing really interesting there. And again, after some stopwatch consultation and a networking with cheetahs, it's turned out that the derivative of 42 is just 0, still. OK, so the last thing here we need. So the last thing we need to do is we need to deal with this sine of y's derivative before we can finally solve for y prime and run from there. So we've got the e to the sine y. Nothing particularly neat about that. But for this guy, the derivative of sine of y. Well, the derivative of sine is cosine. So that's cosine of y. And then we have to multiply times the derivative of y for all that chain rule reason we talked about back in term two. So we get e to the sine y times cosine of y times y prime minus 4 e to the x equals zero. And there we've got everything ready. Our only task now that we're left with is to get that good old y prime alone. We want to get him by itself. So our function actually reads y prime equals whatever it is we're looking for. So from here, I've got a couple steps I need to do. I'm going to add 4 e to the x to both sides. And again, at this point, like we're done with the actual e to the x stuff. So what am I going to get? I'm going to get a whole bunch of junk hanging over here. e to the sine y times cosine y times y prime equals 4 e to the x. And then over here, I'm going to divide everything 
on both sides by the lovely expression given by e to the sine y times cosine y e to the sine y times cosine y and that's going to get me to what could be my answer so y prime equals 4 e to the x divided by e to the sine y times cosine y and then that would be um, just perfectly willing to be our final answer the only thing I'll point out is that since we've got two pieces here that have the same base we can actually go a step further if we want and use an exponent rule and I think it's always good to emphasize the exponent rules when I can so in reality what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine this guy with this guy in my mind I see e to the power divided by e to the power equals e to the top power minus bottom power. So I'm going to do the exact same thing here. This top part is going to become 4e to the top power minus bottom power. And the denominator then will be a little bit cleaner. It'll just be cosine of y. So these guys, or this guy, the second one, is a little bit nicer. This is equal to dy dx. And all I have to do is, of course, box it. But since you're in my calculus class and you're watching this, you know boxing and lines, all those things, um, not necessarily my strong suit. Yeah, that's not a good box, but whatever, we got it. And so there's our derivative. Key step was being able to use the chain rule as well as using that derivative e to the x. And again, we saw it work really conveniently when we had just a number times e to the x, because then we just get the derivative as the number times e to the x. And we saw it a little less conveniently when we had to actually use the chain rule and some implicit differentiation stuff over on this first term. But again, nothing super difficult. It's very doable. It's just another rule to get um, thrown into the mix for you when you're taking derivatives. Okay, here we are. Final problem that we're going to look at as an example. The rest you'll get in the homework assignment that came with this or accompanies this. Um, what we want to do is we want to use this derivative of e to the x and look at what happens when we're trying to analyze a function with it. So in this case, we want to find and classify all relative extrema of this function, which involves e to the x. Now, I wish I could tell you some practical application that involves functions like this, um, but I can't think of one off the top, side, top of my head. So for now, we're just doing it for um, theoretical reasons and for practic practicing reasons. So we want to find and classify all relative extrema. If you remember then, to find relative extrema, we've got to look at when f prime is equal to zero. We've got to figure out where are those possible ones, the potential maxes and mins. And then we'll use an analysis table to actually go through and figure out where those points are and analyze the slopes and all that good stuff. So for now, we want to actually start by taking the derivative. So we need to figure out what is f prime of x equal to. Well, when we look at this function, this guy is going to be pretty easy. You can probably figure out what the derivative is in your head. Minus 6 e to the x, the derivative is going to be well, minus 6 e to the x. It's nothing really interesting there because it's just an x up there. And the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. We just have a scalar in front. Lovely. This guy, though, we're going to have to do a little bit more work. And in particular, we're going to have to use the product rule. And the reason for that is we've got x times e to the x. Although the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x, when there's another function in front, we still have to adhere to all the calculus we learned back in the first term. So we need to figure out what that derivative is equal to and do all the parts together. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to emphasize that this is what's going to be our derivative. So again, I'm taking the derivative of minus 6 e to the x. It's just minus 6 e to the x. The only thing of interest to us, really, is going to be that x e to the x term. So for now, I'm going to use the product rule. So the product rule says it's going to be the derivative of the first one times the second plus the derivative of the first second one sorry, times the first. And then, of course, the whole thing minus 6 e to the x because that was the derivative of the other term. So again, where I do this normally, eh, we'll start with maybe, but once you get more into the problems and get more comfortable with this, you might be able to do the product rule in your head. So from here, the derivative of x is just 1. So I've got 1 times e to the x is e to the x. For this next one, ooh, this is exotic, we've got e to the x is derivative. Well, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, so we really have e to the x times x, which is just x e to the x. So very cool looking. And then, of course, minus 6 e to the x. So right here, we've got our expression for f prime of x. Now, looking at this, though, um, if we want to analyze it, it doesn't look like it's going to be very easy because we've got a ton of stuff going on. There's all these e to the x's. Well, actually, there are a whole bunch of e to the x's, but the beautiful thing is there's really an e to the x in every term. So even though e to the x is a variable expression, we can actually pull it out and factor it out as a GCF because there's just a bunch of pieces sitting around in there. So I'm going to pull out an e to the x because I see all the terms have one. 
When I pull it out of this first term, what I'm left with is a 1. When I pull it out of the second one, I'm left with an x. And when I pull it out of this last term, I'm left with a minus 6. So my derivative is e to the x times the quantity 1 plus x minus 6. And of course, that guy is equal to a much more convenient looking expression, e to the x times x minus 5. So that is the same thing as our derivative of the original function f that we had. So there we go, kind of nice. We've got our derivative written out. Now the question is, what's it going to look like when we actually analyze it? Because our goal is to find the relative extrema and classify them as max of the mins. So we need to look at a table, or at least our analysis table. So for the moment, I'm starting by setting up the table. I've basically got one critical point here. So the question is, when does this equal zero? So looking at these terms, the first possibility would be, when does e to the x equal zero? Well, there are two ways we could see that this is actually impossible. One, e is a positive number. When you raise a positive number to a power, you're always going to get another positive number. Like even if it's a negative power, that just flips the entire thing. It makes it smaller. So in fact, this is never true for that reason. Also, if you want to solve for x, you could ln both sides. You'd end up with x equals the ln of 0, and it doesn't work. So in fact, this is always positive. So typically, I have a little bit more room. I spaced it out better. But that first part, e to the x, is always positive. So we don't have to worry about that guy. The second one, though, figuring out when x minus 5 equals 0. Well, obviously, we can see our one critical point is just going to be x equals 5. So I'm just going to write it over here as c equals 5. That's our only critical point. So when we set up our table, we just need the one spot for c equals 5. That will give us a 0 on the derivative of f prime. Now for the rest of this puppy, we need to actually go through and figure out what those other intervals are. Is it positive or negative there? Because if it goes plus to plus, well, it's not even a in relative extrema. If it goes plus to minus, it's one thing. If it goes minus to plus, it's another. So let's go through and actually look at what happens on the interval negative infinity to 5, and then 5 to infinity. So we need to figure out what is the sign, S-I-G-N, of each of these terms. So now again, I'm going to look back up at my function here e to the x, or because f prime of x is e to the x times x minus 5. So let's look at this. Let's start with a number. So I'm going to pick 0. If I plug in 0 to f prime, what do I get? Well, e to the 0, well, if you think about it, this is always positive anyway. So this really isn't going to impact the sign at all. So e to the 0 is just 1. That's a positive number, like we said. 0 minus 5 is negative 5. So we have a positive thing times a negative thing this guy is actually negative. So let's see now. Determine what the power comes out to be. So if this is that's x equals 6, because that's a bigger number than 5, e to the 6 power, well, it's still just positive. 6 minus 5, though, is also positive. Positive times a positive is positive. So that tells me what my behavior is around the critical number x equals 5. Now the question is, we found where we have a relative extrema, it's that x equals 5. We could go back through and figure out what the y-coordinate is, we'll do that in a second. But I want to know, is this, max, is this extrema a relative maximum or a relative minimum? Well, based on the pattern, we can actually see that. The function is going from negative slope to positive slope, which as our little picture shows here, we have a relative minimum. So we can prepare for our answer here. We're going to have a relative min at the point x equals 5, comma, whatever the function value is at x equals 5. Well, to find the y-coordinate, I'm just going to go up there and plug it in. So f of 5 is going to be equal to 5 times e to the 5 minus 6 e to the 5. Well, those guys happen to be like terms, because e to the x or e to the 5 is a GCF. So 5 e to the 5s minus 6 e to the 5s is negative 1 e to the 5. So in this case, we have a relative minimum at negative, can we draw the parentheses, negative e to the fifth, for the y value. And it appears that we've actually solved our problem. So now, of course, it would be irresponsible of me to just leave it at that and not actually check on the calculator since I have one. And since this is all kind of new to us, I couldn't even prove it to you because we're so uh, limited in what we know so far. But let's see. Does this reasonably look like the answer? So I've still got the calculator hanging out here. So let's ask it. So we're going to graph the function x times e to the x minus 6 e to the x. 
was just about to hum the song x times e to the x and then I realized that there was no such song my apologies so here's our function hmm that is quite interesting it suddenly gets very tall so I'm thinking my window is just not good well let's think about it the minimum is going to be at 5 negative e to the fifth e to the five is about three to the five which is a really large number it's like <laughs> it's big so it's like 243 so let's just go ahead and make this we're expecting the x the minimum to be somewhere at five so we'll throw that in there our minimum value I'm gonna make it go down to negative 300 we'll make the maximum value 100 who cares and then we'll make our y scale by tens so it happens so again, we're looking for a minimum of some sort. There we go. That looks reasonable. That looks like a minimum. See? There it is. You can see my mouse, I hope. Oh, it's off to the side. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got to remember that. So there it is. There's our minimum. So looking at this guy, let's calculate the minimum and see what happens. So minimum. Let's go left bound. <laughs> it looked like it already found it for us. Right bound. And then it wants me to guess doesn't have any confidence in its ability. It says the minimum is at x equals 5, comma negative 148.4132. Well, let's see for a second. What is e to the fifth? So negative e to the fifth is negative 148.41 something. So it looks like we have in fact found our relative minimum. So there we go. It appears that we have in fact now used the derivative e to the x. So just as a quick little review of what we've done here, um, well, there's nothing on this first slide, but whatever. Um, to start with, we just kind of talked about looking at a graph and figuring out that e to the x is kind of special. Um, in calculus, the reason it's special is it is its own derivative, like the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. From there, we use the chain rule with it, so it's e to the f power, time, e, its derivative will be e to the f times f prime, or e to the u times u prime if you like the u thing. Um, and then from there we did a couple examples, one where we just had something interesting happening inside the E, then one where we did some implicit differentiation with it, just looking at some little things that could happen, and then lastly we used the derivative of E to the X to find and classify some relative extrema for a function with E to the X. So it turns out it works pretty nicely, this is a great derivative rule, it will probably become one of your favorites with due time. So anyway, this is Mr. Steele, um, I'm good on this one, first lesson out of the way. Thanks for stopping by.